Welcome everybody for this week uh, seminar of the Department of Marine Geosciences. I am honored to, um, to, in, to, to host, we are honored to host uh, Dr. Antje e. Volkel. Um, Dr. Ante Volker is based in Portugal at the Portuguese Institute for the Ocean and Atmosphere, IPMA, and Center for Marine Sciences, CICIMAR, from the uh, University of Algarve. Uh, uh, Antje is a paleoceanographer studying centennial to orbital scale climate variations and their impact on the thermohaline circulation in time intervals ranging from the recent past to the Pliocene and in deep sea records recovered from polar to subtropical regions. Her basic tools are the shells of planktonic and benthic foraminifers and their stable isotopes and or trace element signatures. The planktonic foraminifer fauna that data also provide information on temperature, biodiversity, or biostratigraphy. In addition, she integrates sedimentological, which is grand size, ice, ice rafted debris, XRF, and biomarkers or data from other microfossil groups into her studies. She participates in, the, in international programs like integrating ice core, marine, and terrestrial records from a, a 8 to 60,000 years ago, which is the Intimate, or the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, Inter International Ocean Discovery Program, IODP. Following her participation in IODP Expedition 339, the Mediterranean Outflow, much of her research during the last years focused on reconstructing the history of the Mediterranean Outflow water and the surface waters of southwestern Iberia during the early to late Pleistocene. I just, before we start, I just will uh, like to remind all the students, uh, if you can mute uh, the phone, the, um, the audio during the talk, but please do not forget to, to ask any question you want in the chat, which is below uh, the screen, or just wait until the end of the talk that we are going to widely uh, welcome all questions. Okay, Antje, the podium is yours. Okay, hello everybody. So, um, as uh, Nicola said, I will present you some data related to the Mediterranean outflow from the Gulf of Cadiz. So, we jump from Europe side of the Mediterranean Sea from Israel all the way to the western edge, or even out of the Mediterranean itself to the Gulf of Cadiz. This is a work that is ongoing for several years already. And as you can see in the list I'm listing down there, there are lots of people who contributed during the time uh, to the study and the data I will show you, which are a lot of people in Portugal, but then I have also collaborators in Spain and Germany, and it goes on and on. I'm not listing everybody here. So just to give you a quick um, outline of the talk, I will give you a short introduction to the motivation of the study and the regional oceanographic setting, because you might, a lot of you might not be familiar really with the region. Then I will give you some introduction to the IADP expedition, during which time we actually drilled our sediments, and then go on to the methods to show you which proxy records we, you will see and how we constructed the age model. And then you will see the data on the surface uh, ocean changes in the MO. And finally, the conclusions. So for the motivation of the study, I mean, you're the figure on the right side, I just put in because it's a nice comp compilation. You don't really have to see and understand everything there is just to highlight some of the things I'm listing for the motivation. So we are interested to understand the climate change to the mid Pleistocene transition or nowadays it's also called the early middle Pleistocene transition because what we see is that we have a change in the dominant climate cycle from the 41 kilo years before the transition to the 100 kilo years after the transition. And especially important in that part is this period between 950,000 and 900,000 years, 
which is like in, in earlier times, which was normally what people call the mid Pleistocene transition. Because what you can see at the very bottom panel um, down here, that is like the relative sea level change. And you can see that there is a switch from relatively lower sea level during glacial periods before this period to, uh, no, to higher, far, sorry, from higher relative sea levels to lower relative sea levels after this period. Also, what we know already based like on here, this Epsilon neodymium data is we know that there was a weaker Atlantic overturning circulation before and after. And that means we have less North Atlantic deep water actually arriving down in the deeper South Atlantic. And likewise, it also has an effect on the carbon storage in the deep ocean, which is like the figure up there above. If you really want to know more, one paper to really read is like the one I'm pointing out down there. It's the one from Jesse Farmer, which where this figure is from. So why are we actually also interested in the Mediterranean outflow? Since it's kind of a unique water mass that we have in the North Atlantic. And the uniqueness you can actually see down here in the figure which shows you the salinity anomaly that is related to the methane outflow water that we see in the intermediate depth North Atlantic. So you can see the signal actually spreads wide out into the open ocean. And we already know that because of the high salinity that get exported with the methane outflow water that it has actually impact on the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic. But we also know now from all these studies related to the cold colder worlds, especially the ones uh, on the British and Irish margin, that there's also a relationship between the methane outflow water being present there and the coal mount growth. So we know, and we are interested in the model because it has an impact on the biosphere and especially on the Bansi communities, which goes to what we want to know actually about the deep ocean um, ecosystems, what is like a hot topic at the moment. Just to give you an idea about the oceanography, where, where you are, where, where are we going to be working on? This is a map like showing you the general surface water um, circulation in the North Atlantic. The, read, the working area where we're looking at is this region here on the Portuguese margin and which is strongly influenced by the subtropical Jaya waters, like the Azores current coming over here, the recirculation of the Portugal current, which are all still parts of the subtropical uh, Jaya. Up here in the north, because it will become relevant then later on, is the subpolar Jaya. And what I want to point out here is that in general, the boundary between these two Jaya's is associated with the northern edge of this branch of the North Atlantic current. And this is called the subarctic front or the subpolar front. These are just like names that will come up later on, so I will make you familiar with, with those concepts. Like I said, the, the region we will really look at is the Gulf of Cadiz. And just to already give you an, an idea, so this IEDP site U1387 is the one we will look at most, which is located in the northern part of the Gulf of Cadiz. The uh, arrows you see here is kind of the methane outflow water and we will come back to that later on. Going, zooming in a little bit more on the Portuguese margin surface water circulation, like I mentioned, what is really important for us here and for understanding the climate records you will see today is this influence of the Azores current, which is a current that brings subtropical waters into the Gulf of Cadiz, but also down here a lot um, to the southwestern Portuguese margin, which we sometimes refer to, to the Cenis margin. And this warm water circulation is especially present uh, during the winter. What we have in summer is what you see on the right side is we have upwelling. So we have regions where you have high productivity and slightly colder waters coming up, but they are not so much relevant really for our study area down here. They are also not so much relevant in this offshore region here, which is the location of one of the other IETP sites I will be referring to. 
One thing I also want to point out is here the location of this core MD992339 because you will see some data from this one. This is a core in the more central part of the Gulf of Cadiz. So it will have a slightly different climate record in general than what you would see then in the IODP site. What is really important for understanding the Mediterranean outflow water is a little bit highlighted in this uh, new map that just showed up. The red arrows is kind of the coastal current, which are, sorry, I should say the red and the green arrows are showing you surface water circulations, which are both related to source water is coming from the Azores current with the main Azores current branch here um, shown by the green arrows. The blue arrows are showing you the Mediterranean outflow water. So what is going on is that the water is coming out of the Mediterranean. It's very relatively warm and very saline. And what happens is you get strong mixing between that water mass and the surface water masses which is here shown by these little circles called entrainment. As entrainment, you need to think about strong mixing between two different water masses and then kind of uh, modifying a little bit the signal. Looking at the Mediterranean outflow water itself a little bit, you have here on the left side a transect showing you the salinity profile along these um, stations and then going down really into the central Gulf of Cadiz. What you can see nicely over here, which is part of the region where we will be looking at, is you have this layer of upper Mediterranean outflow water uh, bracing the our bottom. Above it, you have a water mass called the North Atlantic Central Water, which here has a subpolar variety, and we also have a subtropical one above. What is also important is that the Mediterranean outflow water, like both branches, the upper and the lower ones, are relatively low on oxygen compared to the North Atlantic central waters and the North Atlantic deep waters. Also, what we see is if you go further offshore into the deeper parts of the Gulf of Cadiz, you can sometimes encounter Antarctic intermediate water, which can replace the Mediterranean outflow water or is actually mixing with the Mediterranean outflow water. The presence of this water mush is not so much relevant for the study site we were looking at because it's shallower, but I just wanted to highlight that. Okay, coming now finally a map where you can see your homeland back here. <laughs> Um, to understand how we can relate signals of what is going on in the Mediterranean to what is happening out here with the Mediterranean outflow is you need to understand where the waters actually that exit the Strait of Gibraltar are formed. And as you can nicely see here in this figure, you have the intermediate depth water shown here with the orange um, circles formed in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also deep waters. And a lot of the water that exits actually through the Strait of um, Gibraltar is this intermediate depth Levantine intermediate water. There are also some contributions from the deep waters, which is a lot the Western Mediterranean deep water that is here formed in the Gulf of Lyon. Another part I want to point out because it's the only map we actually show this region is that I will show you data from ODP site 967 up here in the Eastern Mediterranean for comparison later on. So just kind of keep a little bit in mind where that is located in the Eastern Mediterranean. Going now to IETP Expedition 339, the aim of this expedition was to actually get core sites for the Mediterranean outflow because before the expedition, we only had cores going back into the late glacial, glacial cycle, like into the middle of stage five and we didn't really know anything more uh, before that period. So during that expedition we drilled the C six core sites which have the black numbering for understanding the Mediterranean outflow history and in addition we drilled a little bit further offshore and deeper down the Shackleton site, the site used 1385. This was exactly drilled to understand the climate history in this region. Because what will happen in all of these 
core sites or what might happen with all of these core sites in the Mediterranean outflow is that you might have current eroding part of your sedimentary record, your climate record, or resorting things. So the idea before the expedition was we will use data from this site, which actually also has in the Benzic record the nice changes between the North Atlantic deep water and Antarctic bottom water to make a, a chronology for our sites in the Mediterranean outflow waters. And you will see that later on. So like I mentioned, the target of my study is the site used 1387. And just as a reminder, it's from a water depth of 500, 559 meters. So it's relative shallow um, to more, more shallow than we are normally used to work with. Just to summarize quickly all the results we have from this IUDP expedition. So you see here all the sites um, that were drilled. This is like I mentioned, the one further offshore and in deep out, which is hemipelagic. Then all the other sites have very um, well developed contourite drift deposit during the quaternary. And if you then go further back in time into the Pliocene and Miocene, you get different things. Data actually from this section is already published. If anybody is interested in it, let me know and I can give you the, the references from that part. We are now working more on understanding really the climate change within the contourite drifts. And U1387, as I mentioned, is the one I will show data from, the one I worked on mostly. Before we go to the data, just to give you an idea how this drift really looked like. So this is the seismic profile actually used for choosing the site for the IATP expedition. U1387 is the one over here. And based on the seismic data, the um, geophysics said we should have an hiatus coming here related to the mid Pleistocene, what they call revolution, and then, then further going back in time. As you will see, this is not really true well based on the data. So later on, the idea was then slightly modified that these uh, hiatuses might be actually different on lateral extension. But this is also a different story. So just zooming in a little bit now on the quaternary part of site U1387, as you can see here, it has in general a sedimentation rate of 15 centimeters per kilo year. And my data records are either with that resolution, so 1,000 years or slightly less between 500 and 600, depending on the climate record. The data I will show you is actually combining samples and data from these two holes, A and B, and then in the end, we also go to hold C. Com oops. Combining these two records is what we call a splice in IADP in ocean drilling, because you will never recover everything in one drilling, so you kind of jump from one to the other. What actually happened to me is that drilling and working in the contrite have turned out to be very problematic. And actually, I spent a lot of time uh, correcting the splice of having to add into the hole in the splice a lot of sediment parts that were missing. That's why a lot of the data is not published yet. But we will go there. So coming to the proxy records that you actually will see. So we use the boloides, the planktonic formalifera globulina boloides with a delta 18 record, which in general gives you a global signal, which is overprinted by the local temperature and, and salinity. And as you will see, we in this case, we also use it for the isotope stratigraphy. You will see temperature data based on, on, the, bio, on the lipid biomarkers, the UK37 ratio, which is an annual mean temperature. And I will show you data of the abundance of the planktonic pharmaneuroglobocardina pachyderma, which in our case indicates incursions of subpolar surface waters. For the Mediterranean outflow water conditions, uh, we will use the epibenzic pharmaneuro delta 18 data, which is also a local temperature and salinity signal combined with the global sea level uh, continental ice volume. We use the epibenzic delta C13 data to indicate the ventilation of the Mediterranean outflow water, 
or I should probably say actually of the water mass we have at the bottom. And because we have for that data actually we need to combine data from these two different species because none of them is, is, uh, is present all the way around, which also tells you a little bit about something that is going on um, in the environment. And then to understand a little bit the changes in the velocity of the Mediterranean outflow water, we have two parameters, which is the weight percent of the sand fraction, which kind of, as you will see a little bit later, is kind of giving you the peak of the contourite layers. And the contourite layer is formed when you have stronger velocity. And we have, in addition, the XRF derived zirconium aluminum data, which will, will show you the broader part um, of the, of the contourite. Like I mentioned, for making the H models in the contourite drift, it's a little bit difficult. So what you see here is on top now, the Beloides isotope record from the IADP site U1387, the one I'm working on. And then in comparison in the middle in blue, the one from the site U1385. As I said before, we work under the assumption that both of these records more or less indicate the same surface water evolutions. And that means if we correlate the two, we can transfer the H model from this deeper water site, which we can actually correlate to the Lezeki and Raymer stack, that we can correlate that H model into our data from the, from the Faro drift. But as you can see, for my data going further back in time, I have a problem here because the Shackleton site stops right there. <clears throat> so the approach then has to be to go to another high resolution record from the North Atlantic, which is down here, the site U1308, where we actually need to use the benthic data because it's at 50 degrees further north, so the planktonic data is a totally different signal. Looking now into details, it's again, you have here on top there in blue, the Shackleton site, uh, Beloides record and now in orange in the middle part, the one from US 1387. In this blow up, you can actually see that we really nicely have the same signals in both. And which is especially relevant for these uh, transitions here between stage 25 and 24 or 19 to 18. Because before um, I was thinking this could be maybe noise because of the current sorting. But we see the same in the other sites, so we can actually trust in our data and believe that it's a really climate record. Another important result that came out of this correlation we can do is that in this period, we actually get very low sedimentation rates during the interglacial phases, which is kind of if people in my, remember that the interglacials in the Mediterranean are related to the subprocrine layer. And it seems to be that this, what you will later see, is an influence, whatever is going on then in that region on the mar influences our sedimentation rates. Like I mentioned before, going further back in time, we don't have the surface water signal anymore. So this is now showing you a figure for the deepest part of the whole record. Um, where we have to, where I have to do the H model on correlating the benthic records of the two sites, which in blue is again the record of U1308, which is like the North Atlantic deep water versus Antarctic bottom water signal, and in red would be the Mediterranean outflow or whatever intermediate water depths, um, water mass we have at the site. So in general, you can see there are some. Um, similarities that allow us to really to make a correlation, but one has to be a little bit careful not to overinterpret the changes because again, there are two really very different water masses in there. But what you can also see down here in the sedimentation rate and what I pointed out is in this older part of the record, we don't really see the changes in the sedimentation rates during the interglacials that we had later on. So there's another piece of the puzzle. Going now to the surface water changes. Before I go there, I have to give you like a little bit more background so you can understand some of the things that I'm pointing out. And that is a lot of the information that we have so far and our concepts that we use to interpret the, 
data in the past comes really from our last glacial cycle. So what you can see here on the left is a map actually showing the, the Radiman ice rafted DB belt that you might be familiar with, which is like this part where we really have a lot of discharge of, of um, icebergs into the North Atlantic and then related um, impacts on, on the Atlantic Mediterranean overturning circulation. What you can nicely see here on the right side is the percentage of the polar species, Neuroglobigona pachyderma, sorry. And you can see that we have a strong gradient along the Portuguese margin, which is caused by the southern edge of this IAD belt, which is not shown so much in this one, but it's over here, more or less what we know from our data, is that we know that this IAD belt comes down to 40, between 40 and 39 degrees north on the Portuguese margin. And you have less strong signals than going further south on, on the margin. Or if you go into the Gulf of Cadiz, there's really we're only influence during two of the high Nikki winds and you get very low percentages. Also, what I want to point out here is that these Heinrich winds one and six could be perceived as terminal stadial events, which is a phrase we use now when we go further back in time, because we know in the period that we will be looking at, we don't really have Heinrich events anymore, but we know that we have strong ice wrestling events, especially during the termination. So the transition from the glaciers to the interglacials. So for those we now use the term terminal state limits. Also relevant for you to understand some of the things I will point out is that we know, based on a temperature record here from the Shekel site from Euro 1387 and from other data from the North Atlantic, is that in these parts when we were pointing out, which is the mid Pleistocene transition, we actually had this subarctic front, which you remember before in the modern day, it would be over here, coming all the way down into the latitudes of the Gulf of Cadiz. And what is relevant for that for you to keep in mind is that the further south you push this front and the more you extend the subpolar gyre, the weaker would be your overturning circulation. So finally looking at some of the data. So this is the, um, the focus on the mid Pleistocene transition interval. So the one I pointed out before, like between 900,000, 950,000, and then going a bit, little bit younger. You have on top again in orange, the Beloitis Delta 18 record. You have now in the middle in red, the icon on temperature with this bar showing you in general, the range that we have uh, today in the Holocene. And then at the very bottom, you can see the percentage of our polar species, the Neoglobulina pachyderma. And what I really want to point out here is that we have these very high percentages, percentages that we would find during the high energy winds of the last glacial cycles within the IAD belts down here of the Algarve. So none of the people actually going on vacation in the Algarve would like to go swimming at that time, because as you can see, you get cold temperatures going down to between 12 and 8 degrees during those periods. So this was really a strong change in the circulation that we have in the North Atlantic for us to get such a strong signal coming down into a region which today would be really be subtractable waters. And this is a little bit conform with what I showed you in the map before is that we have during these events, these like darker blue layers, which are the terminal events, that we have the front really coming down into the latitudes of the Gulf of Cadiz. We also have other um, cold events coming out, which are not as strong during these transitions from the interglacials to the full glacials. So as you can nicely see, these are some of these um, millennial scale oscillations that we observe now also further going back in time. If we look at the older part of the record, which you can see now in this figure is that yes, we also have cold events during that period, but what comes up is that these cold events are not exactly um, 
occurring at the terminations or at the transitions. We only have one in this record, but they come more in the early part of the glacial periods. Nevertheless, we get temperatures that can get nearly as cold as you can see in the mid Pleistocene part. This is a pattern we don't really understand yet. So a lot of what you will see is something we observe, but we cannot fully explain yet. Um, so this is you now you showing you the complete record combined with data from the IUDP site used 1308. Oh, I forgot to point out in the map where it actually is. So this is a site which is in the ice raft to the um, uh, belt of the North Atlantic. So this site is really one that would pick up ice sheet um, discharges from around the Northern Hemisphere. So from North America, Greenland, Scandinavia, all of this you would, should be mixed in. And you have here a record which is also an isotope bracket measured on the bulk sediment fraction, which is interpreted if you have lower values that is related to ice rafted um, events. And in the bottom, you can see that confirmed based on the XF silicium over strontium ratio. So we can actually see, especially during the terminal events that we see in, in, in the Gulf of Cadiz, that all of those are related to ice rafting debris events in the IED belt. So this is a signal which we can call like um, high latitude sig forcing that we see in the Gulf of Cadiz coming down here. And in most of our cold e cooling events that we see in the Gulf of Cadiz are related to these ice rafting events, but not all. And we don't really always see a strong um, cooling in the south when we have ice rafting in the north. What I also wanted to high point out, and this is something I also still try to understand, is that based on the surface water records, and actually down here you now see out of the Benzic Delta 18 record, then we appear to have two types of transitions going from our glacial, our cold climate stages into the interglacial climate stages. So what you have seen before with these terminal events um, is you have always an abrupt shift from the glacial into the interglacial and you then get the warmest temperature in the interglacial part at the beginning of the interglacial. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay, there we go. But what we see in the early part of the Pleistocene is that they actually are more gradual transitions as well. And those are periods where we have the warmest temperatures coming later on, on in the interglacial part. So I thought in the beginning, okay, great. This is like a change between what is happening in more in the 100 kilo year world versus the 41 kilo year world. And then I got the data from these older stages, which are 47 and 49. And as you can see here, based on the isotope data, these go again back to this part where we have this abrupt transition. So now again, another part, we still need to understand why we have these different types of transition and, and climate parts in the subtropical gyre. One part I want to point out because it's relevant for the next one is to remember that this year at stage 26, we actually have a strong cooling in the surface water. And this is relevant to understand a little bit what is going on with the mid Pleistocene transition data. So if you have anything read before, you might be familiar with the bottom record down here from ODP site 1123, which is one of the first ones showing this change, what we say in relatively, uh, relatively sea level, going from slightly higher to lower during the glacials um, after the mid Pleistocene transition. And the step is always associated with the step between stages 26 to 22. The same is what we see in the Mediterranean Sea. In, in the stack from the ODP site, like I pointed out, out in the Eastern Mediterranean. You have this big step from 26 down to 22. If we now look at the data from the IEDP site in the Gulf of Cadiz, you get a slightly different record. And you already get heavier values in the Delta 18 
in stage 26, and you don't see a big difference actually between 26 and 24 and 22. And what you have here and what you have to keep in mind is that we're working at a shallow water depth and that I mentioned before, we have this mixing between water masses, what, what, what the entrainment. So what we actually see here in, in the Gulf of Cadiz is not the global signal, but it's the surface water signal that get mixed into, the, into our Mediterranean outflow water. So these heavier valsitopes I interpret as being a signal of the cooling we see in the surface water that get mixed down into, level, into the level of the Mediterranean outflow water. So you have to be sometimes careful in how you interpret your things and really look at your data. Okay, coming now to the Mediterranean outflow water during that period. Again, a little bit of setting so you can understand concepts. Like I mentioned before, before the IUDP expeditions, we really didn't have so many sediments going for back in time. So a lot of our concepts were based on the interpretation of seismic profiles. And what we had at that point was that we have an interglacial phase and a glacial phase. During the interglacial phase, the idea was that you form more of the contourites in the, uh, along the pathway of the upper Mediterranean outflow. So this part where we were, we, the site I'm working on should show a stronger signal during the interglacials. And you would have less flow going down here in, in the deeper, um, in the lower core of the Mediterranean outflow water. Versus the glacial situation, where you have actually a shift, you would have less water going along the upper core and along really the upper margin, and you have much more transfer going down into the, with the lower core. And this is also related with evidence that we have that the lower core of the Mediterranean outflow water actually went much further down in the, um, in the water column, at least for the last glacial maximum. And there's this evidence I'm showing you here from this part of the margin, um, where we have evidence that the Mediterranean outflow water went, uh, was as deep down as, as 2,200 meters. Where I actually should mention that today, the boundary actually would be between 1,400 and 1,500 meters. So it's a significant shift in, of the water masses in, in the water column here in the open ocean which is related to density gradients, but I'm not going, gonna go into that part. Understanding a little bit our contourites or information where we had before is, we have, you have here some data from two core sites showing you the youngest contourite, the one that is, was formed in, in the Holocene. So you can always see like if you have increases in sand weight or your mean grain size, this is all related to the current velocity. So you're forming a contourite layer. And what I want to point out here is that we, and this is one of the contourite layers where we knew that you would have a signal down here in the lower mole core and up here in the upper mole core, which is actually, this is a gravity core close um, to the one of the IDP site that we are looking at mostly. Also interesting to see here is that in the benthic isotope data, you don't necessarily see any signal related to the velocity changes. For us a little bit to understand why we might have to, um, or what might cause the formation of this contourite layer, because we don't really have uh, the forcing we thought uh, we would need, is I show you here the data with the insulation. And as you can see, this contourite layer, the one here in the Holocene, is actually formed when insulation is already declining. The one you see up here up front, the one C2, is actually the one formed during the Younger Dryas, which has a different climate forcing, which has to do with the cooling that we observe in general. And that one you can see a little bit better in this figure where you have the combined record from this core MD 992339, the one I studied when I moved down to Portugal. And that actually nicely showed that we always have a response down here at this location in the lower uh, metrin outflow water core to all the cooling events that we can see in Greenland. So there is really a strong signal in this part of the record 
Well, we have high latitudinal forcing. So just to remind you, these are related with ice rafting events, with cooling events in the North Atlantic, with shifts of the subarctic front coming further down. So all of that have leaves an impact on the flow strength of the Mediterranean outflow water. We now have this very nice new data from the IUDP site U1389, which I just wanted to show you because it was just published this year. It kind of confirms what I have just shown you before. So this is actually you have here the fine sand data and the XRF data, the zirconium aluminium. It shows you again that also in this location, we have the strong oscillations related to the millennial scale oscillations we know from the last glacial cycle. But if you then go further back in time and look here at stage five or going back to stage eight, we don't really see these abrupt changes anymore. We have much longer term changes in there, but that is again, if you're interested, go and read the paper. But what I also want to highlight here is that in this data, you can see nicely that there's a response to the timing of subpropel formation. That means we have low current strengths and we will see the same again also in my IEDP site. And this is the part where what I would pointed out before, this is the part where during interglacials, we might get lower sedimentation rates. Now looking at some of the details from site U1387, this is just to explain you some of the concepts because I, I, when you have to later the overview figures, you cannot see much <laughs> in there. So as I pointed out before, when I explained the proxies down here, you have the weight percent sent which is showing you kind of the maximum of the, of the flow velocity. And if you compare that here with the zirconium aluminum data, you can see that the zirconium aluminum data already shows increases in flow velocity before we might see the signal in the weight percent sent. So we can use the zirconium aluminum data as telling us that there is already some change in the velocity, but it's not the peak velocity what we see. If we then look into what is highlighted here with the bars, it's one of those contourites layer, the one actually I was focusing on here, is one that is occurring in the interglacial stage 31, which is one of the few ones actually we see in the record that is really formed during, inter in, during an interglacial. So this concept that we had before, um, the expedition that the contour that the contour rate layers in this part of the region, like in along the pathway of the upper mole core, should be formed to the, during an interglacial period, doesn't really hold because we have very few uh, contour rates actually in my record where we have a contour rate really formed during inter during an interglacial. Most of them are related to uh, colder periods or like what you also will see later on uh, in the next figure. So they are more related to the transitional phases from the interglacial to the glaciers or something going on during the, the glacial periods. Also, what I want to highlight here is that when we look at the Bensic Delta C13 data, you can see that we really have periods where we have higher values indicating a better ventilation normally coinciding when we have a contourite formation with periods where we have really very low values. In trying to understand these very low values for us, like I mentioned, we have the Mediterranean outflow water is very strongly linked to what's going on in the Mediterranean. So for this paper in 20, uh, 2015, but also in the papers later on published actually in the same year for the younger record, we can show that there seems to be a link between our benthic delta C 13C signals and the subpropel formation in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, where you can show, which is shown here by these triangles. It's not always a perfect fit, but there seems to be some correlation. What you can also see sometimes is that the period where we have like this benthic delta C 13 minima might be longer at our site in the Gulf of Cadiz than what, what might be indicated uh, what's going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
which might be partially related um, to what you, if you think about nowadays um, or if you're familiar with it, that the organic rich layer that you might observe in the Alvaran Sea is actually preceding and much longer than the subopil layer itself. So there might be something hidden in our isotope signal that relates to other changes in the Mediterranean that we might just not pick up just with the contour with the subopil layers like they were indicated for the ODP sites in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is something where we'll want to look into more further in the future with geochemical data. So this is, you need to wait for stories to come up. Uh, this slide is just showing you that we seem to have really correspondence between ch increases in, in, the, in the current velocity when we have slightly, when we have some cooling in the surface waters. So there really seems to be a strong coupling on what is going on in our surface waters to what is going on with the more velocity, which all has to do with the entrainment and mixing some of the surface water signal into our mole level. But we also have these periods where it doesn't fit, which I highlight here with this orange bar, um, where we have this strong cooling in stage 30 and you don't really see anything with the current strength. You also don't really see a change here during the in interglacial. Again, we have a mixed signal coming out and we have to be very careful not to generalize too much. This is now showing you all the data we have for the Mediterranean outflow water. Don't focus on the details. This is just in general to give you an idea on of the trends. So as you can see, based on the weight percent sand data and the XRF data, we have the formation of the contourate layers throughout the whole record. We don't see really any change related to the mid Pleistocene transition, which would be like this part over here. And we also don't really see something, uh, what we see in some of the deep water records in, in the Benthic Delta Susatin, which is cyclicity of the frown at killer year cycle. It's like nothing in our record is, is um, responding to that. Like I pointed out, stage 31 is one of those contourite layers that we formed during the interglacial. We have another one in stage 37, and that is it. Most of the other ones, like I mentioned, they are related to periods of cooling um, or during the transitions or during the glacials. What I also want to point out here with this blue bar is our period here from the mid Pleistocene transition. Because if you look down here in, in the rate percent sand, you don't really have much of a signal in there. But if you look at the zirconium aluminum, there is some signal here. And I'm pointing that out because when we go to the next slide to look actually at the correlation to the ice sheet responses, you might understand why the weight percent center data you have there is not showing a strong um, as response. What I interpret, interpret here, this signal is that it might be that these responses in the zirconium aluminum is more related to a finer fraction and that's why we don't pick it up in the weight percent sent. So like I mentioned, now looking into this relationship that we had for the last glacial cycle. So the northern hemisphere forcing with the ice refugee re-discharges and the contourate layer formation. This is the period I just like we looked at now in before. Like I said, we don't have the signal here, even though we know there was a very strong discharge from the northern he hemisphere ice sheets. And you can also see that for most parts, um, there is a fit between the, sub, the contourate layers formed in, in the Gulf of Cadiz on, in, the, in the lower mole uh, record and ice discharges. So we can apply this same concept that we had for, for the last glacial cycle that there's so when we had the response to the Heinrich winds that we also see the same here going further back in time. But it's not always a one-to-one -one fit. So trying to understand maybe what other forcing might be there, I looked into this re um, dust record from the Eastern um, Mediterranean. It's again, the same site you have seen before. 
So what you would have if you have more dust arriving there at that site, it was is an interpretation that you had more arid conditions and you would export more Saharan dust actually into that region. In general, we would expect this happening also when we have the iceberg discharges. So you actually can see that there are correspondence between them. Be careful that the ice, uh, the H models between these two sites are not exactly the same. So the concept is slightly different and you might have some shifts in there. But what might actually be helpful for this part over here back in time where I don't really see a correspondence between the ice sheet discharges and my chondrite formation in the Gulf of Cadiz is that here we actually have these periods where we might have more aridity. So maybe more saline and more denser waters formed in the Eastern Mediterranean that then we see out in the Gulf of Cadiz. I'm not showing you this, but if I look into everything in detail, one to one, I still end up with one factor missing. So I have contrite indications for contrite layer information, which I cannot really relate to the ice sheet much, uh, to the ice sheet discharges and the changes in the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic, or like with the lower latitude um, Saharan dust record. So I'm at the moment thinking about that my missing third factor might be the oceanographic uh, conditions in the subtropical gyre. And we don't really have, unfortunately, good data I could use for comparison. So it's also something staying for the future. Looking now a bit more into the Bantic Delta C13 record in this correlation that I mentioned before that we have with the subpropels. So you have here on the top, the Bantic Delta C13 record from the IEDP side. You have then in the, in the middle, the insulation. And in this part, you can see all the indications of subpropel layers, of ghost layers, or of the oxidized subpropel layers, the red clay layers from the Eastern Mediterranean. And at the bottom down here, you also have an XF signal where these peaks are also related, interpreted as presenting subpropel layers. What you can see nicely is we have periods where we have a good fit, which is the one here for the blue bar, which is also the one the blow up I showed you at the beginning is actually exactly from this period. So this is a period when we have strong changes in the benthic delta scenes or in the ventilation of the Mediterranean flow water corresponding more or less with the subpropel formation in the Eastern Mediterranean. We see something similar here in this part actually where the subpropels are oxidized, but we still kind of see a good correspondence um, in what is happening in the Mediterranean flow water. But if we then go into this period here during the early Pleistocene, I don't really see a good correspondence. So this is then a little problem that we have in, the, in uh, interpreting all our data just as a signal of Mediterranean outflow data. Because one could argue that over here, because we don't really see a correspondence to the Mediterranean, the water mass that we see here in the Baltic Delta C13 might not necessarily be Mediterranean outflow water but it might, might actually be the central water. Or we would have a strong mixing of North Atlantic waters into the Mediterranean outflow water to actually kind of lose the signal that we see over here with the, with the ventilation in this part. So now finally coming to an end, I hope that I could show you that we see these millennial scale oscillations uh, during the glacial interglacial transitions on top of the glacial interglacial cycles. We observe these extreme cooling events down uh, on in the Gulf of Cadiz on, on the in the Algarve, and they're all related to subpolar surface water incursions. And in general, also our early Pleistocene interglacial temperatures are warmer than what we would have today. We see that the contrared layers are formed throughout the complete interval, often related to the cold events, so the ice rafting events or cooling in the surface temperatures. There are some of them which, are, which I didn't go into detail so much, but they are related to the insulation minima or like declining insulation as we have in, for the Holocene contrared. 
and maybe there's some link to increased aridity. We have a strong variability in the ventilation with a higher ventilation during insulation minima, so maybe colder temperatures, but the poorer ventilation during these periods when we have insulation maxima and the suburbial formation. And that is then we link all of that then to in the influence of the African monsoon in the region. But as I also pointed out, I think there's more, um, there are other factors also influencing our most signal. So there are still puzzle pieces that we will have to fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antje. This talk was uh, really illuminating with uh, a lot of uh, information. Yes. Very relevant for us in the East Mediterranean. Um, I opened the discussion for uh, questions from the audience. Since I don't see anybody, uh, all of them, so just getting to the, the conversation and ask. Or? Nicolas? Yes. Go ahead, Moti. Hi, Anchi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I, I just wonder why actually during the subpropels you have lower sedimentation rate. I would I would expect just the opposite. Well, that yeah, that part I think that has to do with that we have these uh, more sluggish circulation, uh, so, um, Mediterranean outflow water circulation. So you lose kind of the increased lateral transport that comes with the current um, during those periods. At, at that point, I mean, that's what we see in general during the 100 kilo year world. So that would be my interpretation that, um, and it, I that actually that part with the low sedimentation, right, I had a lot of problems with getting a good age model and I have had different versions. And only now when the high, very high resolution data from the Shackleton site was published and I could do it now uh, correlate again and really correlate then all the, the oscillations going in, I could see that I could only get a good chronology for my site if I would assume very low sedimentation rates during the interglacials there. Yeah. And yeah, for me, it has to relate it with the current and with the lateral transport of material by the current. So you mean that that actually the the, the fresh water are, are making the currents more sluggish? Yeah, out in the Gulf of Cadiz, because in general, um, it, it's like you would get a stronger current um, if you have a stronger density gradient, which actually I think I forgot to explain that. So you, in general, you would have a stronger current or increased velocity if you have a stronger density gradient in your water column. So you have to more mixing. And what I, I assume for these periods when we have the subpropel formation is because the water coming out of the Mediterranean should be less saline. You would also have a reduced density gradient in the Gulf of Cadiz. Okay, so that's the, that's the point, okay. Okay, more questions? I, I actually um, I, have, I have a question that's kind of a follow-up to the same question. Um, so with, I mean, it, it might, you might not be able to answer it because it's an age model question essentially, but are you, is the presumption with the age, I'm sorry, I, I have a problem with some background noise. I'm going to put it in the chat. No, you can just keep on talking. There wasn't really so much noise. <laughs> Up. Okay. I need to see the chat. I lost my stress there. No, uh, no. Ah, you need to, yeah. Here it comes, the chat. So the question of Beverly is, is the grain size increase presumed to be increased sedimentation rate? Um, in general, yes. It's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. But if we would have an increase in, in grain size, so we have a stronger current, you would also transport more material to the site, which is the whole idea in the background of forming these contrarite drifts. So you have the contrarite drifts formed when you have a relatively strong bottom water current 
laterally transporting material to your location and then sedimenting material at your, at your location or along the pathway. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, somebody has more questions also writing in the chat window. Mm. Okay. Okay, I guess no more questions. So it, it's difficult with the, this um, wait. Nicholas, um, wait. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you, I have a question. Can you say something about the, the, the amount of salinity or the salinity of the uh, Mediterranean water? Can you see the variations in salinity or just through the current uh, uh, intensity? So you're picking on the big point that we have for understanding the changes in the Mediterranean outflow water because we cannot uh, really reconstruct salinity. I already, when I did the study with the stage three, we already talked to modelers because we were trying to convince them to model what would happen or why we would have the changes. And the problem was always also to get a salinity value for the waters coming out of the Mediterranean. Because in pyogenography, we have really trouble reconstructing salinity. Um, we have kind of some assumptions. Well, we can, we can do temperature relatively well. But for understanding salinity, especially then over these longer time periods, you also need to understand uh, the sea level change because you need to re uh, co correct your oxygen isotope value actually, which, we, which you then use to calculate salinity for the sea level influence beside the temperature influence in there. And so the, it's the, the sea level, it's actually the ice volume and how that would affect your delta ADO. And that is where we are really stuck and where we really don't go ahead. So yeah, not knowing really what the salinity was of the water that came out of the Mediterranean and then how it actually changed in the Gulf of Cadiz along the branches is a big question. And because all are, like I pointed out, the salinity is actually the one most strongly influencing the density in the Gulf of Cadiz and the currents of the most. And would also be then probably the factor mostly influencing if you want to really see into timing changes between the upper uh, mo core and the lower mo core which we also don't really, we are not there yet. And I'm not sure if we will ever get there. And yeah, it's uh, trying to get modelers to do it. It's also difficult because a lot of the big climate models don't really model the outflows of the Strait of Gibraltar or really connect the Mediterranean with the Atlantic. So yeah, that is a big part. If anybody studying on the Mediterranean outflow, that is information that we are missing which is essential, but we are missing. Okay. More questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Antje. It was really interesting. If you are interested, I can keep you in the loop for our next um, uh, seminars that they are going a little bit around the planet between time zones of New York to China, okay? okay. <laughs> and um, for our next week, we are keeping actually in the uh, Iberian Peninsula and we're moving from Portugal to Spain, okay? Which actually you reference to the Spanish guy worked in the IODP 967. So he's going to talk next week. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm more than invited. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, with these words, I close the uh, seminar and I'm looking forward for next week. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, Antje, you will receive a present from us. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>